What's good, Deck Gang? Clearly, I believe the Steam Deck is a paradigm shift for video games. I think it's going to introduce a lot of people to playing on the PC. And because of that, I'm starting a series to help guide beginners through gaming on the PC, Steam, and inevitably Linux. This is the first episode, and the idea for this one is that I want to let you know what to expect from PC gaming and help you determine whether PC gaming will be king for you. What beginners can expect from PC gaming will shift over time, and the Steam Deck will certainly contribute to that shift. They are trying to give a more console-like experience after all. However, I think there are some core principles to PC gaming that are unlikely to change. So I'm breaking this video up into three sections to convey what those core principles are. First, I want to tell you about some PC gaming myths. Then, I want to talk about console gaming expectations. And finally, I'll tell you about PC gaming expectations and how the two may clash sometimes. Note that none of these groups are monoliths and the audiences are actually quite varied. But the way I'm approaching this is, if I'm used to console gaming, what would be weird about PC gaming? And vice versa. So, let's get into it. Alright, it's Mythbusters time. Console gamers definitely have an image in their head of PC gamers, and it's probably a lot like this comment from Dizzy, where he says, Are all PC gamers virgins? Well, Dizzy, I certainly can't speak for all PC gamers, but for me, I can tell you for sure that I am a virgin. Okay, so we're not busting that myth today, but let's talk about these other ones. The first one is that PC players need the best graphics and performance. I think the audience that plays video games on PC is way too broad to say something like this, and the perfect evidence is Steam's own hardware survey. As it says on the Steam survey page, they conduct a monthly survey to collect data about what kinds of computer hardware and software their customers are using. Participation in the survey is optional and anonymous, but they do get a ton of information every single month. The most used graphics card in this survey is a GeForce GTX 1060. This is a 5 year old graphics card, and as a result the average person is playing games in 1080p. Furthermore, the list of top sellers and most played games include games like Noida, Disco Elysium, Slay the Spire, Into the Breach, Counter Strike, and Rocket League. I think these games all look great, but they certainly don't require the latest and greatest hardware. So no, the average PC player is not necessarily seeking out top-of-the-line graphics and performance. A second myth, somewhat related to the first, is that PC players are obsessed with tuning and tweaking, whether that's graphical settings, hardware overclocking, part buying, mod selection, or otherwise. That type of person exists, and they are maybe the tinkerers I've spoken about in previous videos. A tinkerer's philosophy is to maximize the usage of a product that they own. How they maximize that could differ per person. They may want to squeeze the most power out of it, or lengthen the lifetime of their product. But there are also plenty of people that game on laptops, and pre-built desktops, and soon, Steam Decks. Or people that enter the settings menu once for a game and then leave it alone, or others that play less demanding games on their PCs. Either way, tuning is a benefit to PC gaming, but not something that every single PC player cares about. My pet peeve myth when it comes to playing on PC is that there are a lack of exclusives. The way I see it, PC gaming has the most exclusive games of any platform. I think that when we talk about modern day gaming, PC may be lacking the everybody is talking about this or the everybody is playing this exclusive, but even then, it does have stuff like New World, Mountain Blade, Phasmophobia, and Shadow Warrior 3. But where PC really shines is in allowing you to really dig into your absurdly specific interests. If you love fighting games, I would argue that there's no better platform than PC, and it has the most fighting games of any other platform. If that Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl fighting game looks good, you might be surprised to know that this team already made a sick fighting game with Slap City. Footsies is a game that distills fighting games to the bare essentials. It's only a couple bucks on Steam, but it doesn't exist on consoles. Of course, if you're into shooters, PC is the perfect platform, not just for the heavy hitters like Battlefield and Call of Duty, but also for the resurgence of retro shooters or boomer shooters like Ultra Kill, Severed Steel, and the upcoming Cultic and Celico. Couple all that with emulation and you get to one of my favorite things to say about PC games. Almost all console games will eventually make it to PC, while most PC games won't make it to any given console. There's nothing like it. The final myth is that gamers don't hit the like button on YouTube videos that they enjoy. If you're liking this so far, bust that myth and crush the like button. If you think you want to see more stuff like this, hit subscribe and slap the bell. Now that those myths have been debunked, let's instead talk about console gaming expectations. These are the things that, if I'm someone who exclusively plays on consoles, I would expect from my playing experience. I would miss these things if they weren't there. First, I would expect games to just work. 
PC players expect this too, but I would say we are more aware of the different ways games can be caused to break. We know that there's no certification process for most storefronts, and we know that our hardware is a factor. It's kind of like, imagine Sony lets you try to play a PS5 game in your PS4. If the game was not so demanding, it would just work. But if it was a more graphically demanding game, then you would have to tweak the settings to avoid detrimental effects like screen tearing or single digit frame rates. And if it was even more demanding than that, it might not run at all on your old hardware. Console gamers have the hardware stamped on the proverbial package they buy, you know, because it's all digital now anyway. But Steam players instead enjoy a generous refund policy that lets them try any game on the store and if it works, then great, but if it doesn't, you can always return that bad boy. No questions asked if you played less than two hours and return it within two weeks. I think that this could be a hard pill to swallow in the short term and in the long term. In the short term, you might run into a game that's not Linux ready yet, and in the long term, more graphically demanding games will just not play on the Steam Deck. If you have the expectation of, if I can buy it, I can play it, well, with Steam, it's a little more like, if I can buy it, I can try to play it, worst case scenario, I can return it. Of course, for most people, this won't be a problem whatsoever, but for some, there may be some work to play certain games conveniently. Console gamers also expect unified services. Relative to consoles, everything on the PC is pretty fragmented. You have multiple choices for everything, down to where to buy a digital game. The DRM on the game can range from nothing to intrusive kernel-level DRM that affects performance and won't let you play if you're not online. I'm looking at you, Resident Evil Village. Some PC players have to deal with multiple launchers and multiple friends lists. None of that is a problem on Switch, Xbox, and PS5. Each of these is a holistic ecosystem with consistent feature sets. Whether or not you like it, you know what to expect from Nintendo Switch Online. Recording a clip works the same for everyone on PS5. There's one way to stream your Xbox game to another device. There's also fewer graphic settings that you can tweak. It's evolving quite a bit on console, but mostly you're going to have the choice between a preset called graphics and a preset called performance. And that exemplifies the main thesis of what console players are used to, simplicity. Choice is a liberty to those that are used to gaming on PC, but it's a burden to those that are used to consoles. It can result in too much fragmentation, and it can make it more challenging to find the support article that most applies to you. Something like the Steam Deck can help split the difference, but it won't eliminate that burden completely, because the point of a PC is that it's an open platform. With that, let's talk about PC gaming expectations. For console gamers, think of this as what you have to look forward to from the PC experience. PC expectations are driven completely by the nature of it being open. At any time, I can look at the game files on a hard drive or even what values are being set in memory. Most people won't do this, but the few people that do will benefit everyone that uses the platform. Moreover, I can buy the hardware that I want. A single target hardware has its benefits, no doubt, but so does the ability to buy what I want. If I'm on a budget, I can go with something less powerful and sacrifice performance. Or if I need an advanced streaming and video editing setup, I can go higher end and typically leapfrog what's currently available on consoles. All of this has a number of knock-on effects. Let's talk about those. First, there's a lot of competition in who can sell you games. Everybody wants to get that 30% cut that Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, and Valve get, but on consoles, no one can do that. Retailers, especially brick and mortar, may get a 10 to 15% share, but the platform holders still have to get their cut. On PC, there's a lot more choice and therefore a lot more competition. Valve gets a 30% cut, but they let developers generate keys pretty much at will for free. This allows developers to generate Steam keys and sell them in other marketplaces like Green Man Gaming, Humble Store, Indie Gala, Games Planet, and many, many more. Valve allows this because their approach to keeping people on their platform has always been to provide enough value that people want to stay on their platform. CEO of Valve, Gabe Newell, is famous for saying that piracy is not a pricing problem, but a service problem. Provide a valuable service and people will flock to the platform. And naturally, Steam isn't the only platform on PC. There's GOG, Epic Game Store, Itch.io, and the Microsoft Store, each with their own value propositions. GOG traditionally had a focus on bringing back old games with no DRM. If it wasn't for them, there are a lot of legacy games that would be lost in legal spaghetti. Itch.io is the most open platform available and allows developers to self-publish games of all sorts. You'll find the most unique games here. The Microsoft Store has long been considered a dud, but now it brings you Game Pass, the best value subscription in all of gaming.
Epic is one of the newest competitors, and some people have bemoaned its practice of buying up exclusives, but I think that just like console exclusives, this practice has afforded developers a particular level of certainty that they may not have otherwise had. This benefits the consumers because it gives the developers a bigger budget with which to make really unique games, like The Outer Wilds and Axiom Verge 2. Another huge value proposition from Epic is all of the free games. Every week, they give one or two games out for free with no real catch. Technically, of course, the catch is that it will hopefully incentivize you to use their store and their launcher as you amass a large library on their platform. I'll take that chance and grab the free games every single time. I know I said it's a myth that PC players are tuning obsessed, and it is a myth, but the option to tune is key. I hate motion blur. It may be part of the artist's intent, but there are times where I want to override the artist's intent. PC lets me do this more often. In my Teardown Revisited video, I gave an example of Dark Souls as being a bad PC port. It locked the frame rate at 30 FPS, locked the resolution, and did not allow me to rebind keys. These things are a bare minimum expectation of people gaming on PC. At the time, it was obviously fine on console, because there was one piece of hardware to target, so it makes sense to be 30 FPS with a locked resolution and minimal rebinding options. But that has never been okay on PC. If I can run at a higher frame rate, I should have that option. If I'm okay with a lower frame rate, I should conversely have the option to pump up the image quality. And there are so many different input possibilities that key rebinding is seen more as a right than a privilege. With that being a model for the bare minimum then, it's easy to see how the mindset and philosophy becomes, the more options the better. If I look only at Doom Eternal's video settings, I'm presented with about 40 different options. Many of these have at least 6 different quality settings to choose from. Do I want the texture filtering to be low, medium, high, ultra, nightmare, or ultra nightmare? Do I want resolution scaling? Do I want it to dynamically adjust the scale? Or do I want to set it myself, somewhere between 50 and 100? I can adjust the field of view to see more or less on my screen. Or I can change the aspect ratio if I have an ultra-wide monitor. If I'm less of a tuner, then I can just let the game pick a preset and roll with that. But again, on PC, I have the option. I have the choice. I can probably go on for days about this topic, but I'll give one final expectation from the PC crowd. Modding. I think the typical console player has a misperception of the modding scene as amateurish and unworthy of your time. Just like game development, the modding scene has a wide spectrum of quality, and modding itself has a large variety of uses. Alternate skins are an easy example to comprehend, so I think that's what a lot of people picture when they think of modding. And alternate skins are dope as hell. A lot of people will go as far as buying cosmetic items like these in their favorite games, but look down at them when they're offered for free in an unofficial and unsanctioned capacity. But that's not all. Mods extend the life of your game, either with improving graphics capabilities with the times, or by providing new gameplay scenarios. Let's look at Doom, the quintessential PC game to mod, as an example. There are a few different ways to mod Doom. First, the developers made it so that the content was easily replaceable. When I say content, I mean enemy sprites, level designs, sound effects, wall textures, and weapons. So they made it easy to make a whole new game inside the Doom engine. Games like Heretic, Hexen, Strife, as well as Doom expansions and Doom 2 itself all utilize the Doom engine and mostly just replace the actual content of the game. On top of that, they eventually made the engine itself open source. That means a lot of people have taken the code for the engine and rewritten it for modern platforms and sensibilities. They added more graphical options, better lighting, modernized input choices, as well as things that have fundamentally changed the engine like support for 3D models, sloped floors, and new mechanical options that were not present in the original game like free look, jumping, swimming, and crouching. Together, these possibilities can be combined to make awesome games like Slayer's Testament, which plays like a demake of Doom 2016. Or better yet, the upcoming Celico, which looks and plays nothing like the original Doom game, yet it's built on its foundation. This is what modding makes possible. Games like Grand Theft Auto and Skyrim are famous for their wonderful mod scenes. Games like these have made it mainstream, and now it can be incorporated in things like Steam Workshop, where you can share and play custom Portal 2 levels, or Minecraft and Roblox, where the game itself is a marketplace for the various mods. Consoles have begun to adopt this too with products like Little Big Planet, Super Mario Maker, Dreams, and Game Builder Garage. User-made content opens up a whole new world and dimension in your favorite games, and it's no wonder that it's one of the main tenets of gaming on PC. So in a nutshell, moving from console gaming to PC, you will lose some things and you will gain some things. You will lose simplicity and you lose choices being made for you. That means that in PC gaming there can be fragmentation and it can be harder to find the support that you specifically need. 
Hopefully places like this channel can help you narrow down what you're looking for, but it can't be as simple as it is for console gaming, because that's what consoles do best. And what you gain in PC gaming is openness. That results in forward compatibility. If I want to play the original Max Payne on consoles, I'm going to have to find my PS2 or original Xbox. But if I want to play it on PC, I just hit download on Steam. If I add a game to my wishlist, I can use a service like Is There Any Deal or GG.Deals to notify me when there's a discount. There are services like this for console, but there's only one store to get a discount from. On PC, there can be a dozen or more. The competition is fierce. If I want to turn some settings on and some settings off, or I want to rebind some buttons, all of that is standard on PC. And if I want to modify the game I bought with new weapons or new levels or new features, that's a lot more possible on PC. All of that is why PC is king for me. If that excites you, then maybe it's king for you too. Let me know in the comments. And if you made it this far, you are a real one. So in all seriousness, if you enjoyed this video, hit the like and the subscribe, slap the bell and tell a friend. Because I love making this kind of content and I can't do it without the support of the real ones. Thank you. Deck gang out. Goodbye.